Next, discover how archaeologists study disease by finding long forgotten canal workers. Then, find out what happens to abandoned cemeteries and what we can learn about them now. And the resting place of Thurston the Magician is getting a makeover. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. In the middle of the 1800s, cemeteries were our first parks. They were our first green spaces and families gathered there for picnics while kids played around the headstones. And that's when some of the spooky legends started too, because let's face it, we all have imaginations that can run wild. In the early 1800s, cemeteries were a lot smaller than where we are now in the Blendon Cemetery in Westerville. And some people who died from terrible plagues were buried in mass graves. OSU archeologists are working to uncover canal workers who suffered that fate. They died of cholera, Let's find out what they can learn by digging up the past. How's it going, guys? We're in uh, Pickaway County right now, uh, and this is a, a township cemetery. I just found the outline of a bear, of a coffin, but still deep. We are looking for canal workers that died of cholera in 1833. We are interested in understanding the history of a disease. So cholera is still a disease that kills oh, thousands of people worldwide. It killed millions during the 19th century. And um, by looking at cholera in the past, we're hoping to learn something about cholera today. Cholera got into the region in 1833 when somebody came from Cleveland on a canal boat. And um, when cholera just um, was here, it killed a lot of people, especially among the poor. And uh, here specifically, there was a group of canal workers that were digging uh, the Ohio Erie Canal. And um, a majority of them were affected by cholera and died. And so at that point, they were buried here because it was a cemetery closest to uh, the canal, which is just uh, 20 meters away. These people would have been immigrants. They would have been people who were marginalized in society. Um, and so we're hoping to find these people and give them a voice in the history of Ohio. What we can learn from cholera victims from so long ago, even though we might not have their names and we might not have their identities, is that we can scientifically analyze the skeletons to learn about their sex, their, their height, their uh, ancestry, and this will really help us understand who lived here 200, uh, 150 years ago. You can see a difference between the outline here that has a different kind of color and texture and what is actually in the coffin. We have a skull showing up there. 
So now we're gonna get it down to the same level and start exposing the bones. What we've found so far are a number of graves which we're, um, we're excavating and, and removing the remains. We've also found um, some pieces of metal which are probably coffin nails. We've also found quite a few prehistoric artifacts uh, like flint flakes and, and arrowheads as they're commonly called. And then we just sift it by pushing it back and forwards until most of it has gone through the screen. If it doesn't go through, we help it through. There could be a tooth in here or a very small finger bone or something like that. So we have to check every single one of these pieces and parts. There could be uh, nails, there could be uh, shroud pins. There's really little uh, about them in history. So we're trying to reconstruct the lives of individuals who were pretty much neglected when they were alive and forgotten in death. So we're really trying to reconstruct uh, this piece of history. But it's a relevant piece of history for the U.S. because it's the Ohio Canal era, so the major economic development in the 19th century. And by oh, telling the stories of these individuals, we're hoping to bring more attention to that kind of oh, time period. I think it's really important. I think it's important that everyone's stories gets told from their own context. And even after people are gone, you can really still learn a lot from their bodies about their histories, their families, how they ate, how they lived, how they worked, and in some cases, how they passed away. So I think it's really important to add those stories to the overall narrative of Ohio history, and even in a more general term in bioarchaeology, to adding everyone's stories to the archaeological record. What we hope to teach students here are the methods and techniques of archaeology. Also, wanting to teach them what the outcome will be with analysis and trying to understand uh, how this cemetery was formed, who is in it, uh, and whether we can also give a voice to these people where there are no headstones, where there are no records of how these people lived and died. Next, the forces that change a cemetery and what we can learn from them today. Then, Green Lawn Abbey, a majestic mausoleum and the efforts to save it. Just like the evolution of a city or neighborhood, cemeteries evolve over time too. For example, headstones change from massive Victorian structures to modern, simple stones. This next story tells us how the oldest cemeteries in Columbus have changed and what we can learn about them now. 1797, Lucas Sullivan came, platted the town, started inviting people to come up and, and live here. People are starting to live here. Well, people are going to start dying. You need a place for them to be. Franklinton Cemetery started in 1799, and you're gonna find a lot of Revolutionary War people here because this was a part of the Virginia Military District. It was the only way that Virginia could pay some of their veterans. War of 1812 veterans in this cemetery as well. And a lot of the founders of Franklinton and Columbus You'll recognize the names. We have the Goodells, you also have the Sandusky's. McDowell's, McDowell's. Uh, Deerduff. There's even a street named after the McDowell's. Mm -hmm. If you look around, the cemetery's not that big. So as the population increased, we had to find other places to go. And so one of the things they did was they started to move out from Franklinton and into Greenlawn. There's a movement in the mid-1800s to start to create cemeteries outside of cities. Uh, one of the reasons was for health reasons. We had a lot of cholera epidemics, typhoid, and you're burying people in the ground and that could possibly get into the groundwater. Also for development, Sullivan had a grist mill and a sawmill nearby. The river was right past us and in the 1850s a railroad was put into this space and in the 1890s another railroad was added to that which pretty much was the death knell of Franklinton Cemetery. When uh, Green Lawn was created in 1872, the prominent families were starting to buy their own family plots and bringing their family to those resting places. There was one African American buried here. His name was Arthur Boak. He actually was adopted by the Sullivan family. He was born about the same time as uh, Lucas Sullivan's son, Joseph. He was supposedly the son of an ex-slave. Uh, and Sarah Sullivan decided to uh, bring him into the family, adopted him, raised him as one of their sons. He was buried here with the family, 
and then as the family was moved to Green Lawn, he so was moved with them as well. So that shows you just how much the family particularly cared for him and made him a part of their, their family. Columbus is actually founded in 1812. And in 1813, there's a public cemetery, and it was just called the public cemetery at that time, just north of where Naughton is today. It was outside of the city limits. It later becomes known as the North Cemetery. In the 1840s, there's a little bit of, uh, of development, and so there's concern about the size of the cemetery and its growth, but it still continues to grow. There were three or four additions to the cemetery. As the rail systems start to come in in the mid-1800s, it's pushing up against that area. What comes with rail? Industry, business, people. And there's a decision, again, as part of the movement to move cemeteries outside of populated areas to take down the North Cemetery and try to remove those bodies, they're going to be moved to Green Lawn. One of the news articles I read said that they had removed over 800 bodies in that initial process, but we're still finding today that there are a lot of people who are still residents of that cemetery, so to speak. Today, it's known as the North Market. I have no doubt if they start to dig and they start to build apartment complexes, they're gonna find bodies. So I would just say when you go to the North Market, just remember to walk lightly because you never know what you're walking across. <laughs>were Chinese in Columbus uh, kind of early on, you'll find that uh, some of the first burials were actually at Green Lawn Cemetery. And then at one point, a particular burial in 1956 for a gentleman named Chan Wu. He was a patriarch of the Chinese community at that time. He had passed away and because of the uh, Chinese New Year holiday coming up, uh, the burial had to be set for a Sunday. Green Lawn's regulations said they couldn't bury people on Sunday, so they had to look for an alternative. They came here to East Lawn uh, because they would allow burials. And as a result of that, the uh, Chinese community actually gathered together and said, we're making a decision to propose to buy a huge lot out here for future Chinese burials. So we're here at East Lawn with Thor Triplett, the owner of the cemetery, and he'll give us a little more history. East Lawn Cemetery was founded in 1923, and it originally comprised of 80 acres. During the Depression, East Lawn lost about half of its land in foreclosure. The mortgage was owned by Capital University or the Lutheran Seminary College. The area that we're in right now is the original Chinese section. It was dedicated by the Columbus Chinese Benevolent Organization in 1956. This is the Lee family. They had the Hotoy restaurant, which was down on State Street. It used to be on uh, Town Street at one time. Back behind us is the Yi family. They had the Ding Ho restaurant, which was one of the oldest Chinese restaurants in Columbus. There was a fellow that approached me back in 1998, and his name was Andy Chan. And he was a friend of Michael Sao, who owned the Kahiki restaurant. And at that time, the Kahiki was doing food preparation, frozen foods. Andy Chan and another fellow decided that they wanted to provide a benefit to their employees who were making egg rolls frozen prepared egg rolls because there was diminishing room here in this section here and no room for expansion that they wanted to open up a new um, section in the cemetery north of where we're standing now. So they bought about 75 grave spaces with an option to purchase additional. A lot of the headstones that you may see in the Chinese sections, you'll notice that they're black or red. The red color represents an evil free condition and for the Chinese today, it represents um, happiness, good fortune, and protection. So Thora, seeing a lot of offerings at the tombstones as well, was this for a particular time, or is this just something that people are coming out to um, and doing periodically? There are folks that come out here on Fridays, typically. They'll light incense on all the headstones and the graves, and they'll put down offerings. I was looking at this. This was pretty elaborate. Would that indicate their standing in life? Not necessarily. The fellow that um, did this particular headstone, he um, is a developer in China, and these are his mother and father, and they owned um, a lot of restaurants for them to remember the opportunities that the parents gave their family. They wanted them to be honored in this manner. 
One of the things that reflects our culture and our society is how we take care of our dead. And it's reflected in everything from the simplicity of Franklinton Cemetery to the beautiful tombstones that you see over in the Asian cemetery. So it's a great opportunity, even if you don't have ancestors here, to again look at a community that you are living amongst. Okay, pop quiz, Javier. Mm -hmm. Who is buried in Greenlawn Abbey? Wait, is this like who's buried in Grant's tomb? Because I do know the answer to that one. <laughs> no, but the list is massive with dignitaries, a famous magician, and the Swisher Sweets brothers. Now efforts to preserve Greenlawn Abbey has been a decades long process. And unlike other abbeys, Greenlawn is simply a work of art. We're in the uh, south side, near south side of Columbus today, near Greenlawn Cemetery on Greenlawn Avenue. And uh, we're going to visit uh, Greenlawn Abbey, which is actually a mausoleum. And uh, I remember it from years ago when it was in terrible condition. Um, since then, a preservation group has taken it over and it worked some miracles with it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to finding out what's been going on here. Look who's here. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Kate. How are you? Good Very to see good. You. Very Janice? good. Janice? Nice good to see you, Jeff. Yes, yeah. nice to see you. Thank you for coming by. Oh, thank you for inviting us. I've yeah. uh, been looking forward to this. It's a work in progress still, but it's a, she's a beauty. Uh, tell me about the, the design here, the, the two levels. Well, this building's on the National Register because it's a particularly fine example of Palladio-inspired architecture. He was an architect in Italy about the 1600s, and he formalized a style that is totally symmetrical and very refined and somewhat elegant in its styling. So true to the Palladio tradition, this is a two-story building. So we're gonna start you on the first floor and show you some of the things that are in here, including work that's in progress still. Let's have a tour. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this. So come on in, Jeff. Be careful, because like I said, this is still a work in progress. Watch the step, huh? So wow. this is the Abbey, and it's just as beautiful inside as it is outside. It really is. Now, now tell me about a mausoleum, the, the function, um, how do they work? Well, mausoleums were traditionally um, by one family. And they were, it was traditionally um, a wealthy family that built it for them and them, their family. So if you see a little building in a cemetery, that's a mausoleum yeah. typically just for a single family. Exactly. Yeah. But this is not part of Greenlawn Cemetery, is it's that not. correct? Okay. It's not, it's totally separate. Who built it? It was built by the Columbus Mausoleum Company. They started it in about 1927 and then it had its grand opening in May of 1929. These look like historic light fixtures. Uh, was that a restoration? They are original, and they were in pretty sad shape. And actually, Janice, who's put a lot of moxie and muscle behind this project, uh, took them down and cleaned them and rewired them, and now they're back up and uh, illuminating this space. It does take that personal effort. Then here we have some of the crypts all outlined in marble. And I notice uh, the Thurston name here. Now, Thurston was a famous name in Columbus, as I recall. Now, this is Harry Thurston. Mm -hmm. This is Howard Thurston, the magician's brother. Okay, so they're both here. Yes. Howard is down this side of the hallway. Okay. Harry was like a um, little bit of a Chicago shyster, and he helped support <laughs> um, Howard during some of the lean times and to get him started financially. So here on the first floor, the ground floor, I see there's some stained glass. There are how many windows in the building? 60 windows. And We've this got a is, lot. This is unrestored. Obviously, it has some damage. You haven't gotten to it yet. But That's upstairs, right. you've done more work. We've done a lot of work, and the, build, and the windows up there are exquisite. Let's go have a look. These doors are original as well. Wow, what a space. Yeah. Oh yeah, you've, you've done wonders here and... Uh... 
I mean, if you had seen this space when we started, it's amazing. It, the transformation is absolutely amazing. It's just really terrific. You, you've accomplished amazing things. You can hardly tell those are restored windows. They look so original. I know. What a great job that was. Well, I can see here on the main floor, some of the, if not all of the bronze gates are still in place. They, they never disappeared. That's right. On the second floor, we do have all the bronze gates. Here's something else I want to show you, some of our other original equipment. Oh my, what's that? <laughs> For lack of a better name, we call it our Crip Lifter. <laughs> and of course, it's used for getting people's uh, coffins up to the higher levels. Over time, a lot of, when the Abbey was in very bad condition, a lot of people moved their loved ones out of the Abbey. Okay, so, so it either, might have a name. But nobody in it. But nobody okay. in it. And this is a wonderful device. It looks positively medieval. <laughs> it does, like it's doesn't intended it? intended <laughs> to throw rocks over the wall of a city or something yeah. like that. But and this is an example, too, of one of the windows that had to be bricked in because it was lost. Right. And they Just ran out of resources gone. to take care of it. Right. Well, let me tell you about some of the other people down this hallway. Okay. Right here, we have H.R. Penny, Herbert Rice Penny. He was J.C. Penny's brother. Ah. And he ran operations on the East Coast of the United States while his brother, J.C., focused on the West Coast. And down around this corner, we have two of the Swisher brothers from Swisher Cigars, which oh, are I still in operation today, but they're owned by another company. Rollin and his wife are here. His wife and his three young children that died in infancy mm -hmm. are here. Now this is one of the first, this is the first window we restored. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a beautiful it piece of work. It was collapsing on itself. The lower half was mm -hmm. just buckling like an accordion. Boy, it's in beautiful shape. Yeah. It is now. <laughs> and now there's one more famous Columbus family we need yeah. to Yeah, follow me down here. To. I'll show you a couple more. This is the crypt for Louis Sells and his family. Oh, the circus family. The yeah. circus family, yes. And he was the last living brother. Well, you can tell this family had a certain amount of wealth because <laughs> they really have a big space. And flair. I mean, they have, they have mar marble columns. They've got this incredibly ornate, beautiful bronze um, gate and a freestanding marble statue. That yeah, so we're, so we're very lucky to have so many of the original pieces here. Well, what a wonderful place. Well, what you've accomplished here with a volunteer and nonprofit organization is just amazing. And Kate, you mentioned going into business. Yeah, we're going to start operating the mausoleum business again, accepting cremated remains only, which makes, you know, there's always a community need for mausoleums and cemeteries. Well, and it'll be on a nonprofit basis. It'll it support the building, its preservation, so that, that, exactly. that, really, that really works. Isn't that makes it a sustainable long term? That's, yeah. yeah, well, and preservationists like to see buildings used for their original functions whenever you can. Yeah. But thanks so much. It was a great oh, tour. Always a pleasure. Thank Matt. you for showing me so much and showing me how far you've come. Mm -hmm. And uh, best wishes for the future. Curious Seabus is WOSU's project where you submit your questions about our region, its people, or its history, and we assign a reporter or producer to investigate it. For this segment, we're heading out to Hilliard. Now, if you're familiar with Hilliard, you'll know that one of the city's main arteries is Cemetery Road. It cuts right through the center of town from east to west. But if you cruise up and down the street, you'll have a hard time finding an actual cemetery. That led one curious resident to ask us, where is the cemetery on Cemetery Road? Was there a cemetery at one time? Where was it located? Did I overlook it? Nope, you didn't overlook it. The cemetery in question is Wesley Chapel Cemetery, which is about a mile south of where Cemetery Road is today. According to the Hilliard, Ohio Historical Society, the cemetery was founded in 1818. In 1870, a federal law passed that allowed public funds to be used to construct roads from towns to the local cemeteries. So it was around that time that Cemetery Road was built for citizens to travel to Wesley Chapel. By 1914, the section of road that led directly to the graveyard had been renamed Dublin Road. So there you have it. Hang a right on Dublin Road and you'll find the reason Cemetery Road has that name. Do you have a question for Curious Seabus? Head to wosu.org slash curious to submit your idea, vote on which question we should investigate next, and see what we've covered so far.
Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Keep the ghosts in the graveyard and the wolves at bay. When the time comes, will I go or stay? Just make me dance. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, We've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Wartime. Marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health. Focuses on you and your family. With a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State. Changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.